Artificial Intelligence, a Fans Novel, Book 2, Chapter 8, Where the Lions Weep. The amphibicopter moved quickly through the night sky. Because of the fortunate accident of breaking the ship's comm unit, their path could not be traced. But the hunt was on for the rogue lover mecha and his strange little accomplice. Police were manning new vehicles and taking witness reports. At locations all around Rouge and all the way into Scotch Plains and Morristown, they stopped other craft and asked questions. Had they seen any police cruisers in the area? Had they seen a mecca and a little boy aboard? The police could not have imagined where the fugitives were headed. David and Joe did not know this, however. David was too young to understand, and Joe had never been in bad trouble before. He did not know the lengths that Orga would go to to preserve their laws. As they dashed over the open seas, the sky ahead began to glow. A new day was coming, in a growing wash of purple and then red against the horizon. David never slept. Neither he nor Joe, indeed no Mecca, understood the passage of time the way Orga did. Each new day was just a continuation of events. But for the special little Mecca, this daybreak had a new portent. David did not know that he felt like Orga did upon awakening at the prospect of a new and better day. What now stirred his unique processor was hope. Until this morning, it had only been another word in his intentionally limited vocabulary. Now it had a meaning. Soon he would be a real boy. A real boy. The promise of Mommy's love was getting closer and closer as they zoomed over the restless waters. As the trio neared their destination, they flew into a great bank of fog that shrouded the city. The collision alert system came on automatically, and a digital display of large rectangular objects grew on the inner walls of the cockpit. David was wondering what these might be when the fog cleared and the outlines faded to be replaced with an actual view of what lay ahead. They were buildings jutting out of the water, old and gray, rusted stalagmites reaching weakly into the sky. They had once been part of the height of civilization, but that had been before greed and arrogance had ruined the world. While mankind had been looking for the advent of some prophesized monster, deciphering ancient rhymes and riddles, their own prideful negligence had destroyed what had taken them centuries to create. Their new power, this ability to manipulate the various forces that shaped the planet, driven by greed and thoughtless pursuit of more and more of everything, had corrupted the very mechanisms that stabilized the gentle balances of their environment. So it turned out that mankind had become its own beast, its own prophesized demon. Manhattan, the sunken city, the place where mysterious entities yet made their home. What manner of life still hid within the rusted walls of these dark and ruined skyscrapers? You are entering a mecha-restricted area. The words flashed upon the glass in front of them. The amphibicopter's onboard computer sounded a quick alert as the words flashed again, and then repeated the phrase aloud in a warning tone. David and Joe ignored the warning. They had no choice but to go forward. There was nothing left behind for either of them. As they passed another invisible barrier, the warning stopped. David saw an odd statue as they flew by. It was a hand thrust out of the water. In its grip there was a faded stone thing that may have once been supposed to represent a torch. A flock of birds erupted from the holes in the flame of the torch and flew in all directions. David wondered what had happened to the Orga world, but he forgot that thought quickly as Joe slowed down. They had come to the first of the great structures. They had arrived at the end of the world. 
Destination achieved, the computer said as they flew by the last invisible gate. Manhattan, David, the lost city at the end of the world, Joe said, his eyes taking in all around him. This was a place he'd only heard about in rumors and warning tales. It was said that even Orga were afraid to come here. Where the lions weep, David added pensively. But David saw no lions. He saw only huge shadowy buildings, broken and ancient, sitting quietly in the ocean. Where would there be lions? Was it a riddle? The giants that had looked so solid in the distance now proved to be broken, hollowed-out husks of buildings. He had not seen buildings so big, ever. Even the structures in Rouge City had been much smaller. And there were things inside the buildings. David could see them through the broken windows that ran up and down the length of them. There were chairs and tables and desks, like the one Martin had at home, but much bigger. They were strewn about in disarray at all different levels of the buildings. Within the clutter were unidentifiable items, huge video monitors and shattered computers, and paper, so much paper, it was tossed around everywhere. What had the Orga been writing on all that paper, David wondered. Beneath them were the tops of smaller buildings that barely rose above the waterline, and in between them were boats. David looked down excitedly. The boats had sails on them and floated lazily in the breeze. David knew sailboat. All boys know what a sailboat was. Did people live there? What a mystery this place was. It was indeed something out of a fairy tale. They came to another large set of buildings. These ones were much taller than the rest. Perhaps they had once reached into the sky, mocking the canopy of stars above a shining proof that man had conquered the seasons. But all things must pass. They were ominous shadows now. One of them had fallen and was leaning against the other. Rust and corrosion lined the metal frames that ran the length of the giant ruined towers. Teddy freed himself from David's grasp and stood up on the dashboard. There was something not right about this place. He could sense a rumble some small vibration all around him that did not feel like it should be there. He growled as he surveyed the area. Joe looked at the small bear. Was it trying to warn them of something? He knew that Mecca were not supposed to be here. Maybe they knew. The Orga. Maybe they knew that he and David were here and had set some dangerous trap for them. Or what if this blue fairy was indeed some magical thing? Joe scanned the area, but could not discern a threat. In this dark place, however, anything seemed possible. David felt the rumbling, too. It seemed like it was all around them, but he could feel the source shifting as they flew through the silent city. He had an idea. Turn around, Joe, David said. What was the boy talking about, Joe wondered, to come this far and quit? We're not going to give up now, David. Joe replied in a resolute tone. But David was not thinking of giving up. He had realized that they had come into Manhattan from one direction and had not changed direction since. What if what they were looking for was on the opposite side of one of the buildings they had already passed? Turn around, Joe. Turn all the way around, he said, not bothering to correct Joe's assumption. But Joe had realized what David meant. He accelerated and flung the craft in an arc. They circled the fallen building and were now headed in the opposite direction. There were more small buildings and taller ones ahead of them. These were more solid-looking structures, more stone than glass. They had a different appearance, older, firmer. Their windows were still intact, and only darkness could be seen beyond the glass. David wondered what lay in that darkness. Now they could hear the rumbling clearly. There was some kind of pillar before them. Massive. Stone. Water was tumbling down the face of it. Joe lifted the craft up the length of the pillar, and what they saw shocked them. Before them were two great feet. Clawed feet. No, David realized. They were paws. Joe slowed down, and they looked up simultaneously. Above them, the riddle was solved in an instant. 
Joe began to move again upwards, and the immense statue face of a great lion came into view. Water was pouring from its mouth and eyes like a fountain. It wept. The great statue lion stood hundreds of meters above the water, and behind it was a building. To their left there were other lions, all of them gushing water from their mouths and eyes, creating a great rumbling that affected all around them. Joe flung the craft along the front of the great building. It was a stone fortress, just like the smaller buildings, but it seemed to be newer than the rest. Its walls were not worn and decrepit. The rims of its windows were not browned with rust and decay. Was this where Dr. Hobby lived? Did she make her home here, too? David could barely contain the excitement that coursed through him as they moved slowly up the front of the building. It towered over the weeping lions, and they could now look down on the statues. David and Joe discerned an opening in the building where the copter could enter. Joe glided the craft out of the sunlight, smoothly into the shadowy landing dock. Then they alighted. Destination achieved. Joe pressed the canopy button, and before the door even finished opening, young David set his teddy aside and jumped excitedly out of the craft. Professor Hobby, he yelled, as he rushed into the shadows of the landing bay, heedless as usual of any potential danger that might lie there. Joe was more cautious. This place was dark and seemed strange. He heard Teddy rumbling beside him and picked the bear up. I guess you and I will have to keep an eye on him, eh, Teddy? Joe said. Then he carried Teddy out of the copter to catch up with David, who was already running up the stairs at the back of the dock towards some glass doors. Beyond the doors, a dim blue light shone through the fogged glass. As Joe walked up behind David, he saw that the boy had slowed and finally seemed to be engaging in some caution, too. He was glad to see it. They still had no idea what lay beyond the doors. Let it be what he wants, Joe thought. He did not know why David's satisfaction would be his as well. He was not programmed for these thoughts. As they came hesitantly closer, the doors opened. This area was smaller, a hallway of some sort. It led into darkness on either side of them, but David saw that before them was another door. It was not glass like the others, but made of some thick, solid material, and on this door something was written. The letters of the phrase shone in an eerie light. He walked forward, but already knew what it said. Come away, O oh human child, to the waters in the wild, with a fairy hand in hand, for the world's more full of weeping than you can understand. David stepped closer, and he could see that the words were not actually shining, but had been carved into the door itself, and through them a quiet room could be seen. Beyond this door lay his dreams. The fairy tale had been right. He would tell Mommy about this when he came triumphantly home to her, he would tell her of all his adventures. He could see her now in his new imagination. She would run to him and hug him up and shower him with kisses and squeeze him and promise to never let him go again, to never leave him alone again, to love him forever. There was a feeling like music in David now. It sang throughout his body and in the once secret part of his brain, which had all but taken over every aspect of his processing. He had never understood the music of Orga, but now he thought it could make sense. These tones in space, this emotional language. Now this anticipation of his dream come true had changed him again. He was happy. He could go home soon. Joe looked at his young friend, the first creature he had ever been given the opportunity to care for. David's face was ecstatic. Check that! Joe had never seen a mecha look like this. A new realization dawned on him. Maybe David wasn't really like him after all. Maybe David was something different. Something new? The boy's glowing smile was contagious, and as Joe returned it, he had another realization. There'd be no place in David's new life for a rogue prostitute mecha like himself. Once David was a real boy, his mommy and daddy wouldn't want the likes of Joe around. 
but he accepted this. If he never saw David again, remembering him like this would be forever a bright spot in his brain, a moment he could look back on and relive again and again in whatever dark place his future found him. Joe didn't know what love was. He didn't realize how closely he had embraced it. He held his hand out to the door. It was a gesture of letting go for him. Go now, David, the gesture said. Go and find your dream. David stepped forward. It was his time. He reached out and turned the handle, and then he stepped into the quiet office of the mysterious Dr. Alan Hobby. Professor Hobby? David said. His words fell flat in the quiet room. Is this the place where his dream will be made real? Could such magic really occur in a place like this simple room? It was not so much different from the rooms at Mommy's house. There was a table ahead of him. It was glass, and surrounded by chairs. The chairs were blue. They were all the same. This must be a meeting place, David realized. Perhaps someone had been here recently, perhaps often. Maybe many people. Had these floors been walked upon by Orga made new from ones like himself? Perhaps the Blue Fairy herself had sat in one of these very chairs. His excitement was a vibrant thing now, roaring inside his head. It is happening, it said over and over. It is really happening. Before him were books laid open on the table. A lamp above the table lit the pages, displaying a scene of someone's intense study. Against the walls there were shelves of books and books and more books. So many books. Mommy and Henry had not had so many books in the entire house as there were against these walls. Dr. Hobby would probably be the smartest Orga David had ever met. If he was Orga. What if Dr. Hobby was like Dr. No? A floating head with no substance. Would he play games? Would he taunt and tease and... But that did not seem right. This room did not seem like the room of Mecca. This room was warmed to the level that Orga felt comfortable, and Mecca would not need so many things for comfort, so many chairs and books and tables. Across the room David saw more doors, glass doors, like the others, they were fogged, so you could not see through them. Perhaps the professor was through these doors. Maybe he was working on another happy mecca, making them real. David started cautiously towards the doors, his new mind creating images of what might lie beyond. Professor Hobby, he said louder. Then he heard a soft whisper of paper against paper. He turned, and in the corner he saw a chair. A big one, like the ones in Dr. No's office. The chair was facing away from him. Then he heard it again, a sound as if someone was turning the pages of a book. Professor Hobby, he said. The breathless anticipation that he was programmed to simulate felt all too real now. Before him, cloaked by the back of the chair, sat the one who held the answer to all his dreams. David stepped quickly towards the chair. It was surrounded by a fortress of books. The golden light of a small lamp illuminated the corner of the room. The professor must be there reading. David stopped behind the chair. He imagined a thousand things reserved for Orga that he would now know. He imagined the feel of the grass on Mommy's lawn against his feet. He imagined the eating and the swimming and the running and the dancing and a million of Mommy's hugs and kisses for him, and him alone. It is happening, his new brain said. The fairy tales are real. Is this the place where they make you real? David said. It was no more than a whisper, a plea. Then the chair slowly turned, and David saw who sat there. The image was logically rejected at first. No, I did not see that his new brain said. It was a mental blink. The image, though, was refreshed and verified. A boy sat there. 
He was blonde. He was dressed in a soft white jumpsuit that hung on him like robes. David's mind froze. The boy in the chair looked up at the other who had come into the room, the one who had called the name of the professor many times. The boy had heard and registered each greeting and request, but it was not his name being called, and the voice had not triggered any of his limited lists of profiles. So he had ignored the voice and continued his task. But then the intruder had asked a question. The question was general. It was posed to no one in particular. It should be responded to. He searched for an appropriate response. This is the place where they make you read, the boy in the chair said. But the face of the other did shock and confusion. The boy in the chair did not intend for his response to create this type of reaction. So he did smile to show friendliness. David's friends stood at the door, observing the spectacle before them. Joe's eyes darted back and forth between the two boys. He had heard of things like this happening, but he had never anticipated it here. Not with David. This was trouble. David's mind could not process what was happening. He did not understand what he was seeing. Inside his head mechanisms that were still learning to cope with new and as of yet undefined feelings now choked on the information they were receiving. The boy in the chair was impossible. He could not be. A thousand questions were stuck at the ports of David's mind. Are you real? David said, stunned. The boy in the chair did not understand this question. He looked deep into his mind and found a suitable response. I guess, he said. Then he went back to reading. It was his task. Are you me? David said. He didn't really want to hear the answer. Something inside him was already running away from this place. But another part of him was opening its eyes, another aspect of this imprinting that Cybertronics had not anticipated. Something basic and feral was awakening in him. I'm David, the boy in the chair said. He did big smile and reached up to do shake, but the other was not interested in doing shake and the gesture went unanswered. You are not, David replied stepping away from the outstretched hand. The awakening thing inside him grumbled and rose from its solitude. It whispered a dark secret to David's new brain. Yes, I am, the impossible boy said. I'm David. I am too, David replied weakly. What else could he say? Hello, David, the boy in the chair said. The other that was called David would not finish the gesture of familiarity, so he withdrew his hand. He had to finish his task. He stood to walk to the table where the professor had left his other tasks. Then he walked to the table. He sat in a chair at the table. The boy had much yet to read. There were things he had to learn and many things he had to understand and remember. Perhaps the other would like to join him. He turned his head and did smile. Can you read? The impossible boy said. Perhaps you can sit down with me and we can read together. But the other's face was still doing shock. And there was something else there too, something unfriendly. The impossible boy knew unfriendly. He decided that he would calm David. Let's be friends, he said. David did not acknowledge this request for friendship. A fortress had suddenly been constructed around the eternal face of Mommy inside his head. David's own face was a grimace, a mask of anger and fear, a reflection of the new thing growing inside him. You can't have her, David snarled. The beast had been awakened. It had explained everything. David had not understood what David had said. The noise was angry and hostile, but failed to impart any meaning. Excuse me, I cannot hear you, he explained politely. 
She's mine, David said, and his hand moved to the table, grasping the base of the lamp that lit the pages of the book. And I'm the only one, he screamed. The beast inside him roared. I'm David, it yelled, as it moved into the world with a sudden ferocity. David yanked the lamp up and swung. The lamp struck the impossible boy in the face, ripping a hole through its flesh, exposing circuits and sensitive infrastructure. Sparks flew, an electric reek filled the air. The boy was not real, but there was pain, or what could be known as pain. I'm David, David screamed as he swung again. The lamp missed its target, crashing down on and through the glass table. Shrapnel shards of glass sprinkled like sudden hail upon the floor. The books went flying like a flock of escaping birds to land in disarray around the room. The impossible boy still had thought, but he could not see. Alarms commanded action. He tried to rise, to escape, but his body would not respond. I'm David, he screamed again, and this time the lamp struck effectively. It whistled through the space before him and crashed against the impossible boy's head, sending it flying across the room in a violent shower of sparks and electricity. I'm David! I'm special! I'm unique! David screamed like an orga child as he swung the lamp aimlessly. You can't have her! Joe stepped back from the door when the mecha boy's destroyed head landed at his feet. Check that! He looked up at David and saw him swinging the lamp through the empty space where the other had been. Its body was laying on the floor now, wisps of smoke and a puddle of vital fluids escaping from the place where its head had been. What was this? Modified profile indeed. Trouble. Bad trouble. Did that broken mecha have a mommy and daddy like David? Were they here somewhere? They'd be coming for their mecha boy. Joe was unlicensed, on the run. He stepped away from the door into the shadows of the hall. Then he turned and ran, ignoring the complaints of the little bear in his hand. We must not leave David, Teddy complained. But Joe was not listening. Legs whirring, he ran quickly with Teddy in hand to the amphibicopter and closed them both inside. In moments they were airborne, moving quickly from the darkness of the dock, outside to safety. In the room they'd left behind, David swung and swung the lamp over his fallen enemy. He was muttering a mantra, I'm David, I'm David, I'm David, like a prayer. His enemy had fallen, but there was something else that he must hold at bay now. It was something that came crashing through his fortress, even as his own demons were released upon the other. He would beat at the empty air until he killed this thought, until the reality of what was occurring here relented and ran away. I'm David, I'm David, I'm David, he chanted. Something in him had been wounded, and the damage was just beginning to take effect. Like the other, the one whom he had destroyed, he bled. Unlike the other, the pain was not behind him. A silent figure was standing at the door, watching the spectacle for a time. He'd heard the commotion and had seen the amphibicopter dashing out of the dock as he'd rushed down the hallway. He ran to his study and saw the mecha boy's head smashed beyond repair on the floor. In the room, the boy bot's body lay lifeless, but standing above the dead bot, angrily swinging a dented and ruined lamp, stood another David. This one was alive more alive than any mecha before him. He hadn't expected the boy back so soon. David, stop! the man yelled and rushed into the room. He wrapped his arms around the fighting boy and wrestled away the lamp from him. The struggling mecha let go of the lamp and fell weakly to the floor. It turned and looked back up at the man with confused and worried eyes. David had thought it was Joe that came up behind him and took the lamp. But this was another man, an organ man. His face was familiar, but David could not place it. His hair was blonde like David's, but there was much missing from the top of his head. His eyes were kind and intelligent. He looked on David with a curious wonder and concern. This must be... Dr. Hobby? David said excitedly. 
Dr. Alan Hobby, the visionary CEO and director of operations at Cybertronics of New Jersey Manhattan Division, looked down with amazement on this boy, this boy with the face of his long dead son. He smiled at his wonderful creation. Yes, David, he said. I've been waiting for you. They had found him. They had known his precise location, had been tracking him ever since he and the rogue had cleared the forest outside of Haddonfield. But still they'd let him go. They'd decided to conduct a test. David had surprised them, astounded them. Embracing a children's fairy tale and inspired by love, fueled by a desire that they had programmed, their creation had set out on a journey to make real a dream. A dream that they did not predict. Most remarkably, no one had taught him what to do or how to go about accomplishing this. It was all derived from his own self-motivated reasoning, the one aspect of human thinking that they had sought to refine in his brain. And David had achieved this beyond their expectations. They had actually lost him for a while, but when they found him, they had decided not to make their presence known. They were involved in a real-time experiment, a test of a most unique device. It was a simple test, really. Where would his new-found reasoning take him? Dr. No told me you'd be here, David said, looking up at the man who would save him, make him real. Is the Blue Fairy here, too? he said, excitedly. He so longed to meet her. His brain was beginning to sing again. And there it was. Hobby had finally heard it for himself. The thing they had not foreseen, this incalculable element, that this creature would develop its own reasoning. A fairy tale of all things. A child's bedtime story. He cupped the boy's face in his hands. The illusion of his son sitting here with him was so real. But he was not. The professor felt a small reminder of his own distant pain and pushed it back. I first heard of your blue fairy from Monica, Hobby said. At the mention of the woman's name, the Mecca's face lit up. It was the imprinting. It would never leave him. What was it that you thought she could do for you? He inquired. That she would make me a real boy, David said. Not understanding the nature of the professor's question, he thought he was making a request to a qualified representative. Hobby was amazed. He made a mental note to re-interview Monica Swinton. He had to know when David had first begun to understand that it was Mecca. There had been hints all along. The little things the prototype had thought up in its excessive attempts to please the imprinter. The little jealousies that had erupted when the Swinton boy had come home, and the amazing things it had written in crayon. When Hobby had seen those, he had become excited indeed. He had never imagined what the Mecca would do when it fully cognized its own nature. Problems and potentialities were presenting themselves. But you are a real boy, Hobby said with a smile. David was surprised by this. So was that it? Was it really that fast? He didn't feel any different. The man's eyes were scanning him curiously. Well, at least as real as I've ever made one, Hobby said, which by all reasonable accounts would make me your blue fairy. You are not her, David responded quickly, angrily. He did not want to understand what the professor had meant by those words. The singing in his head had stopped again. Dr. No told me that she would be here at the lost city at the end of the world, where the, where the lions weep, Hobby interrupted. Yes, I know, David. That's what Dr. No needed to know to get you to come home to us. Hobby felt quiet to let this set in. The Mecca's face was registering combinations of emotions and mental reasoning that they had not intended to install. David's mind was struggling to put together things that he would just have soon left in incomprehensible pieces. 
The singing in his head had given way to silence, a silence that went to the bottom of his brain. The pain was coming back in that silence. He was feeling bad again. He didn't struggle as the professor lifted him. And it was the only help we gave him to give to you, to get you to come back home to us, Hobby said, as he picked up David and set him in a chair. This is not my home, David said, but there was no fight in it. He was already starting to comprehend what had happened. The image of the blue fairy was retreating into the silence. A scream was building somewhere in that silence. Yes, David, this is your home, your real home, Hobby said. And your real parents are here, waiting to see you again. He smiled down on his creation. David, until you were born, robots didn't dream. They didn't desire anything unless we told them what to want. They didn't move unless we told them what to do. Do you have any idea what a success story you've become? He knelt before the boy in the chair, the simulator whose heart was breaking as he spoke. You astounded us, David. We wanted to see just what you'd do. Where would your thinking take you? Would it take you to the logical conclusion? That the blue fairy is just part of the great human flaw to wish for things that don't exist? Or would your thinking take you to the greatest single human gift? The ability to chase down our dreams. And that, David, is something no machine has ever done until you. The professor's words were assaulting David's brain. They stung him in a way that no machine had ever been hurt. The Blue Fairy did not exist, but the story had said she did. And the story told what happened. And... And this was all just reasoning, wasn't it? Was that what the professor was saying? The understanding came on him unwelcome, unwanted. His reasoning was what made the Blue Fairy real. For the first time ever, David felt tired, beaten. She was supposed to be real. He was supposed to be different, special. I thought I was one of a kind, he said weakly. The professor's eyes began to water. His face was strained and sad. He looked away, as if to some distant memory. My son was one of a kind, he said. You were the first of a kind, David, he offered as a consolation. But David was following a new devastating line of reasoning. If this was his home, and the Blue Fairy didn't exist, then he would have to stay here, and he would never... Hobby stood and wiped the tears from his eyes. The Mecca was too real in its new emotional state. It reminded him of too much. They had set out on a dream quest, an attempt to achieve the impossible, and that impossibility was now sitting before him, gazing up at him with the eyes of the boy he had fathered, loved and lost, years before this robot child had ever been imagined. And what was it he'd imagined? Bringing back his son? Hearing his lost boy's laughter again? That was a fancy. Ellen Hobby was not a fanciful man. He was a man of dreams, of vision. He believed that these two things, combined with information and sheer determination, overcame all obstacles. Pragmatism was the necessary discipline when engaged in pursuits of the impossible. It was what tempered the dream and made it real. David, Hobby said softly. The robot was so quiet, he had to know what it was thinking. This was it. He would never see her again, was what David was thinking. That was really it, wasn't it? The rest really didn't matter. Pain and loss pressed down on him like a living thing. My brain is falling out, David said to no one. Would you like to come to meet your real mothers and fathers, Hobby said. The team is anxious to talk to you. But the robot was not responding it just sat there, despondently, looking more than ever like a sad little boy. It was the imprinting. Considering the high level of unpredictability they'd witnessed so far, they'd have to do something quick before any vital data was lost. The prototype had been through so much. The destruction of the other David was a telling event. 
there could be some internal error occurring. There was really only one way to find out, one course of action to follow. You wait here then, Hobby said to David, when the Mecca wouldn't rise. I'll go gather them up. His real mothers and fathers? David wondered who these people would be. He had only one mommy. Her face burned a bright red pain into his inner eyes. He watched Professor Hobby walk from the room, the man who could have saved him, the man who had instead broken his heart, and now left him paralyzed from the weight of his words. The man stopped once more as he left. He turned to look at David with an odd smile on his face. We want to hear everything about your adventures, Hobby said. Then he paused for a moment, as if reflecting before some crucial step. We want to thank you and tell you what's in store for you next, he said. And then he left the room. Pragmatism required sacrifice. What was in store for him next? Joe and Teddy were gone. He had not even noticed them leaving. He'd actually forgotten about them when his mind had reached out with this new emotion, this hate. With hate, he had destroyed the other, the threat. The immensity of that act he had not understood, but hate had accomplished nothing. It had left him empty and wanting. Mommy was no closer. David was gazing at nothing, lost in his anguish, when something caught his eye. In his departure, Professor Hobby had left the sliding glass doors open. Beyond them, there was something in the room, something he'd not seen before. Slowly, pushing against a great resistance that came from within his own mind, David rose from the chair. He followed the path the professor had taken. One slow step at a time, he crossed the boundary into the room, through the glass doors that had been left open by the professor. The man had not expected David to leave his position. He was used to robots doing what they were told. The big room was quiet. There was the muffled hum of the great lions coming from the window on the other side. Diffused light shone through that window, casting a gloomy light and shadows on the walls. Across the room, near the great window, there were rows of large boxes. There were computers and machines and metal poles that ran up like vines from the floor and along the wall. And hanging from these vines were people. They were boys, like himself. Something in his head told him to go no further. Some part of him that had been tortured too much said that he should go back and sit down and wait for the team to arrive. It said that the team would know what to do, that the pain would be over, and he could... They were him. The boys in the wall. They were him. The boys hung from metal poles. Their faces were expressionless, lifeless. He walked now among them. His unblinking eyes surveyed everything, missing nothing. They wore white jumpsuits like the other David had worn, like he himself had worn when he'd first come to live with Mommy. Their faces were of all the various shades of Orga, and their hair was blonde and black and wavy and curly and long and short. All around him the Davids hung in silence, waiting to be born. And what would they be born into? Their mouths hung open as if some word waited to escape. Their lifeless eyes gazed at nothing. He gazed back. He had been here before, hadn't he? Was this the place where he'd been born? And before that, what had he been? Another lifeless mask hanging from a pole? His mind was running from this place, even as his body stepped further into the room. Before him, in a large chair under the great bay window, sat another of him. The thing in the chair was not completed yet. Its head was opened, like the nanny's had been. A mass of wires and connectors hung from the inside of its opened face. Empty eye sockets looked up at the great bay window, where the gray light came into the room. A loose mane of blonde hair clung to the rim of its opened skull. 
David came closer, to the point he could see out through its eyes, from where the back of its head should have been. He stopped at the chair and placed his face behind the mask of the robot. Gazing out from its empty eye sockets, he looked up at the window and saw a silhouette and printed in shadow. It looked like a bird. Can you say peacock? And there had been other words, hadn't there? Words and questions and numbers and so many other things that lurked within the countless data banks in his head. Something made a sound behind him. David turned to see a row of boxes. Don't, his mind said. Don't go there. But David could not stop himself from walking towards them. He was headed for a great precipice. Beyond that lay an abyss. He stepped slowly towards the edge. The boxes were tall, as tall as he. On the side of the boxes were silhouetted the shapes within. He knew what those shapes were. He should go now. He knew that. But he had strayed too close to the edge. Across the top of the first box it read, A love of your own. Beneath those words he saw what he did not want to see. What he'd known all along would be there. David. There was another row of boxes behind him. They were called Darlene. The boxes filled the empty room. He was alone among them. A sound came again just behind him, making him jump. One of the boxes had moved. Was it alive in there? He did not want to see. He stepped back away from this nightmare, away from the dangerous edge. But it was too late. He had slipped and the abyss was swallowing him up. What had been an assault from a solitary invader was now arrayed by an unceasing army. They had been built too many and too quick. He was not special at all. He was just another blank-faced boy hanging from a wall. He was Mecca, built specific, just another one of many. Duplicable, replaceable, alone.